Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you, uh, the audience, first of all. It's great to see almost a full room. Um, I would uh, like to thank our uh, partner in uh, bringing this uh, session together, this panel together, and that is Belgrade Center for Security Policy. And then, last but not least, I would like to uh, say to our panel that we are very grateful that you uh, have decided to join us, found time to join us. So I'm looking very forward to this session. Um, and I start um, uh, briefly introducing the panel. I'll start with my uh, colleague, the co-moderator of this panel, Vesela Cerneva, who is the Deputy Director of European Council on Foreign Relations. And then next to Vesela, we have uh, Miodrag Milicevic from Executive Director of NGO in uh, North Mitrovica. Uh, and then Donika Emini sitting next to Miodrag is uh, from Civicos, Pristina, Executive Director of Civicos. Uh, Maya Bielos is um, Senior Researcher with Belgrade uh, Center for Security Policy. Josef Pandur is uh, the political advisor to the EU Special Representative Miroslav Lajczak. And uh, we also have the pleasure of uh, being joined by uh, Sylvie Kaufmann, uh, not only an ECFR council member, but also and primarily, mostly, the editorial director of Le Monde in Paris. So a couple of technicalities. We will start the panel with, by showing a short video of the voices that we collected from Kosovo, both from Serbs and Albanians, uh, and also uh, voices we collected from Serbia, to then uh, follow up with uh, Maya presenting shortly a survey that they jointly did with the Kosovo organization. Since we only have an hour and 15 minutes, I uh, say we go straight to the video and then we uh, start uh, with discussions in the panel. Srbi i Almanci dele zajedničku istoriju, dele i perspektivu u EU integracija, ali dele svakodnevne životne probleme koje potiču od puno korupcije, siromaštva, slabih institucija, manjka vladarine prava. I kada bi se radilo na rešavanju tih problema, doprinulo bi se značajno i pomirenju i normalizaciji odnosa. Dijalog kakav se trenutno vodi, mislim da ne doprinosi rešavanju problema, već ga možda i produbljuje, a za istinsko pomirenje treba da postoji politička volja političkih elita koje treba da pošalju jedan dobar signal građanima i to će se onda reflektovati i na svakodnevni život i njihove međusobne odnose. Štiptarodne Srbe duo takento pre paške trugu in trej strukturave u Atlantike, Mir posi që tim këta dy popu i kanë qëndrime politike shumë të kondurta, pas taj dalime me zveti që i kanë këta dy popu i si në aspektin kulturor, fetar, gjithmonë e kam penguar fëqinsin e mirë dhe vazhdojnë të pengojnë edhe sot dhe mungesa e fëqinsis e mirë asë se nuk kontribën në rrugën e përbashkët e Europiane. Mendoj se problemi nuk është vetëm politikë, përgjithsisht këta dy popoj kanë munges të vullnetit për një rrug të përbashkët europiane dhe kanë dalimi shumë të mdha dhe dalimi mëj madhë është në diçka shumë themelore si që është sovranitetit teritorial dhe mendoj që është problem që edhe për një kohë do të apengoj rrugën e përbashkët të këtyre dy popojme. Ja smatram lično da su aktualne političke elite odgovorne za stvaranje animoziteta i konstantno eskaliranje društvenog problema. Isto tako mislim da narodi i pojedinci međusobno mogu izgraditi sebi zajedničku budućnost, ali će za to biti potrebno vreme. Za drugi deo pitanja bih dodao da dialog između Lidera ni u kom slučaju ne može biti prepreka za društvene odnose, ali zloupotreba dialoga i tekako može. Na Kosovo ljudi trebaju živjeti u miru bez obzira na to koje nacije bili, sa koje strane bili, 
i samo mogu dodati na sve to da je strašno, na kakve sve načine se i koliko je žalostno za kako se sa tim ljudima manipuliše. Online dojči për krimi në një të artë me jenë të përbashkot, filimisht komunitetit sërë dhe shqiptarë duhet të fokusuar në proceset e si balafacime të kaluarën dhe pranimi i realitetit në cilin me jenë tani e me duke jetuar. Pa dyshem që procesi i dialogu dhua një rol këtë në krimi në kësaj të artë me jenë të përbashkot. Kjo proces naturisht se nuk është i mjaftu shumë se dhe ka shumë angësi duke filuar nga mungesa e transparencës gjë e cila do një arbu qënë edhe në ngritje në tensioneve mes të komuniteteve, si munges e informacionit rrët marveshjeve të cilat po implementohen ose nuk po implementohen marveshje të cilat kanë vjedhur nga këto bisedime. Mirë po prapë se prapë me të gjitha mungesat, kjo proces është mundësia e vetë me për arritin e një marveshje e finale me së dy shteteve, gjë e cila do të hapte edhe rrug për krimin e një të arme të përbashkët me së këtyre dy komunitetet. Dhe bi Kosovës ki Sërbi, i Albanci učini li korek napred i pokušali da na neki način kreiraju tu zajedničku budućnost zajedno. Mislim da je pre svega neophodan ozbiljan, ali vrlo ozbiljan i iskren dijalog na svim nivojima. I slučajno ovakav kakav se sad odvija, već potpuno drugačiji, ali pre svega iskren od strane političkih predstavnika, ali i od strane pojedinaca. Ono što sad imamo predstavlja samo pokušaj veštačkog pronalaženja rješenja i zato i nema nekih ozbiljnih rezultata. A isto tako moramo da uzmemo obzir i potpuno rajčite pregovaračke pozicije, odnosno činjenicu da su kosovski albanci u mnogo boljoj pregovaračkoj poziciji i samim tim dijalog kao ovakav za sad nema nikakvog rješenja. Verovali ili ne, ali ja verujem svom komši koji je Albanas i verujem da mi nikad ništa nažal ne bi učinio, jer otkad znam za sebe, znam i za njega. Isto tako verujem i svojim kolegivicama sa kojima svakodnevno radim, koji su takođe Albanci. Oni kojima ne verujem su kosovski zvaničnici i institucije koji deklarativno mene smatraju za ravnopravnu građanju. Tako, na primer, kosovsku predsednicu Jula nije mrzelo da nauči francuski jezik i čestita francuzima pad Bastilje na njihovom jeziku kao znak poštovanja, ali do sad nije našla za shodno da meni i pripadnicima moje zajednice u istom i sličnom maniru čestita Božić ili Uskrs. Right, so um, some hope, I think, and some uh, serious worries. But before I uh, move on to uh, Maya, I'd just like to add that, like other sessions, this session is also in a hybrid format, so it's also being shown uh, live. So uh, at one point we will collect a few questions, and uh, those of you watching online could write your questions, uh, and then we will try and collect those as well. Um, Maya, it's not the first time that you work in cooperation with the Kosovo organization on a survey. And so this time you also have some results that are ready to be presented. Would you like to take five minutes to run us through main takeaways? Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. Uh, now uh, we are having a long-standing cooperation with Kosovo Center for Security Studies. We actually realized that only through the cooperation we can uh, uh, see uh, the dialogue through different sides or to measure public opinion poll. Um, and it is great that we had this uh, introductory video so I could reflect uh, and maybe feed the discussion with some of the data, data we uh, received. Uh, I want to mention that we conducted the survey from mid-September to the end of September, both in Serbia and Kosovo, and sample was uh, 1,000 respondents. Uh, 
Um, what polls show is that there is a very high trust in the process of dialogue where two-thirds uh, of citizens, both in Kosovo and Serbia, believe in the process. They believe in leaders and their positions in the dialogue. They truly believe that Kurti and Vucic want uh, that dialogue to succeed. Uh, and uh, there is a strong belief that Kosovo and Serbia will reach final agreement, but not in the near future. That means not in the next few years. In contrast, uh, the citizens of Kosovo and Serbia believe that the process itself is not transparent. We heard from the video as well. And that it has not changed anything in mutual relations. Also, people uh, do not feel any personal benefit from the dialogue. Moreover, they don't know what the Kosovo or Serbia, uh, Serbian government's goal in the dialogue is, which leads us to maybe uh, to one of the conclusions that unconditional support for the process and leader is conditioned by the media, because more uh, than two-thirds or around two-thirds of uh, citizens in Kosovo and Serbia receive information about political developments and uh, Kosovo-Serbia relations through television uh, and then through internet. Uh, thus, a politician through uh, the media can greatly shape expectation from the dialogue. In Kosovo, citizens expect nothing but mutual recognition as the best outcome. Uh, in Serbia, every 10th citizens of Serbia would be in favor of mutual recognition. Cognitive dissonance is evident in Serbia because one quarter of the population would support the return of Kosovo with a broad autonomy to Serbia. Uh, slightly less than one-fifth would be in favor of an agreement consisting of formation of the Association of Serb Majority Municipalities, special states for monasteries including Kosovo membership in uh, United Nations and other international organizations, but without recognition of Kosovo independence by Serbia. When it comes to mistrust, uh, there is a great mistrust towards the EU as a mediator, uh, bigger in Kosovo than in Serbia. Polls also show that uh, the ethnic distance between Serbs and Albanians has not diminished over the time. Uh, and even more, there is great distrust towards Serbs in Kosovo than Albanians in Serbia, according to the polls. In both uh, societies, people are polarized over whether there will be peace between Kosovo and Serbia in the near future. However, positive uh, signals are that the potential for normalization of relations exists but citizens of Kosovo and Serbia perceive differently what the solution would be. Uh, on Kosovo side, I believe uh, one, of, one of the solutions would be a mutual recognition in exchange for Kosovo membership for Serbia and Kosovo, then economic development and transitional justice issues. On the Serbian side, Serbs favor more economic development than establishment of the association, um, and uh, after that, resolving the issue of uh, missing people. Um, when it comes to the priorities for cooperation in future, uh, citizens of Kosovo see trade and economic cooperation should be uh, the priority for the Kosovo government in future, then cooperation at the political level and improvement of people-to-people -people connection. Um, in Serbia, they first favor, I would say, facilitating people-to-people -people connection, then trade and uh, improving cooperation at the political uh, level. I will conclude uh, uh, this presentation, uh, say who uh, contributes the most to Kosovo-Serbia relations, who are the main drivers. Uh, from Kosovo perspective, the main drivers uh, is international community, then political leaders itself, and then business community. Um, uh, in Serbia, uh, citizens do not recognize uh, the role of international community in this regard at all. They see political leaders as uh, the one who can contribute the most to uh, Kosovo-Serbia relations. Then they see themselves uh, um, uh, as the contributors and then business community. However, both citizens of Kosovo and Serbia agree that political leaders are the spoilers. 
and can really harm uh, mutual re relations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maya. So, from the videos and from the uh, survey, there is uh, some hope for the future, for the joint future. There is also a lot of suspicion and a lot of mistrust. Um, I move on to Donika. Donika, would you share your reflection on on the work that you've been doing, from the work that you've been doing for, for a few years, but also from what we have seen um, in the videos and, and the survey? Do you, where do you stand? Do you see that there is, uh, there is hope, suspicion, but there is also a lot of worry about the timeline? Uh, some seem to believe that it will take a long time to come to some kind of an agreement. Thanks a lot, Angelusha. Happy to be here and, um, of course, to share the panel with all of you, but uh, uh, especially with Maya and something that is dear to my heart, which is the field research uh, on, on the specific topic, which I also did while I was part of KCSS. Um, don't ask me about hope. <laughs> I'm literally labeled as the most pessimistic person uh, when it comes to, uh, to panel discussions, especially on this topic, which is quite sensitive. Um, yes, I mean, um, sometimes I'm even surprised. Uh, it is a, a very much support towards the process which hardly delivered to the citizens or delivered very little, or it wasn't even heralded as a process that was shaped to deliver uh, to, uh, to people, but mostly uh, uh, limited to political elites in, in both countries. I'm very happy, though, that uh, young people in our country still see dialogue as, 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 as a very important avenue through which both Kosovo and Serbia not only fix their own issues among each other, but also uh, uh, pave their way towards EU integration, which then we will discuss if that's even on the agenda or that's going to happen. Because when, when we talk about the specific timeline, I think the EU integration and perspective for both countries is very much important as a driver uh, uh, to uh, both uh, countries to actually uh, uh, commit themselves to, to the process. As for the narratives, I mean, the, the first question, like, is there hope? Will something be fixed in the past, uh, in the next five years? I remember 2013. And what happened since 2013? I mean, when you do strategic foresight, when you do forecasting, you always think about megatrends and you think what has happened in the past years and which will potentially shape the future. Uh, and since 2013, all we did was uh, organize panel discussion on what went wrong since uh, the Brussels Agreement. And uh, we hardly actually focused on the positive aspects of it, if any. Uh, so in the next five years, sharing the same concern with, uh, with uh, young people from Kosovo and Serbia, um, it's uh, definitely going to be grim if it were, continues this way, because it is the political elites that actually create the narrative. At this point, we only see a blame game between Kosovo and Serbia, dragging feet approach in, in the dialogue. And then, of course, we see a dialogue process which is heavily dependent on elections. We created a process that is so unsustainable that even elections in south of France would have a detrimental impact on how the dialogue would go. So having all these elements, I agree with, with the young people that if, continue, if it continues this way, the next five years are going to be the status quo, which will deteriorate into a negative scenario. Uh, and, uh, and this is something that should worry all of us. Uh, and uh, one more element is that, yes, we have our differences among each other, but we have differences with, with people from North Macedonia and people from, from Montenegro. So uh, I don't necessarily agree that you know, us, we are different, that's why we, we cannot work with each other, talk to each other. I think it's purely political because all the narratives are being built by the leaders through the media. And this is more emphasized in Serbia. And now, in a way, Kosovo is mirroring it. So these are you know, the, the uh, concerns that I share as a young professional uh, monitoring the dialogue process and working on it since the very beginning. 
uh, now uh, what is important and what is also interesting because we have people from the EU here. Uh, we, since the 90s we talk about the RF Europe and how Europe will fix uh, Yugoslavia and then it's uh, an issue of Europeans and not Americans. But apparently we need Americans because all we talk about now is who are the next US ambassadors appointed in, uh, in the Balkans, Kosovo, Serbia, Bosnia and even Montenegro in order to see if there is a window of opportunity to pair with the EU in order to deliver on the dialogue. Uh, I do uh, salute the fact that in Kosovo, not just international community, but it's a more pluralist environment in which there are multi, multiple actors. It's not like in, in, in Serbia in which you have Vucic and everything depends on a person and the political agenda of one person. Kosovo is more diverse, more, more uh, plural as a, as a system and there are more actors which in a way do not allow the process to, uh, to, um, to be controlled or monopolized. I mean, especially after, uh, after the President Tashi and the territorial exchange idea and, and uh, a critical juncture of the dialogue uh, back in 2018. So, um, as a young researcher sharing the same, same uh, uh, um, concerns with, with the people uh, we saw in the video, thanks for bringing uh, the, imp the, the, the fresh inputs uh, from, from the ground because apparently the dialogue has completely detached from the people and it's all among political elites completely sidelining what the needs of the, uh, of the local population are. Uh, I do think that uh, this is a very critical point, and I'm so sorry for saying this because it's been like, I don't know, two years that we are saying uncertainty, critical point, but this is really a point in which uh, the joint efforts between EU and the US are there, and uh, there is hope bec because of the change in Kosovo, uh, and uh, let's hope that this, this will be a good starting point to actually dedicate genuinely in the process, which will then remove political obstacles and then Jointly, we will work on other issues, differences uh, that we might have as two independent countries. Thanks, Donika. Um, I'll move next to, uh, next to you to uh, Mio Drag. Uh, Mio Drag, you live and work in Kosovo, and uh, uh, almost 22 years after the 99, there is still no proper integration of the Serbian community. And there's a lot of uh, suspicion that the timeline is it's going to take a while until there is a, an agreement uh, endorsed by all. Um, in, in your daily life, what, what, is, what is the reflection that you would share with us in, with regards to what we have seen and heard? Well, I, I definitely risk, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I definitely risk actually to be more even, you know, pessimistic than Donica is, of course. <laughs> I don't know whether anybody in the room, actually including us, of course, in the panel today, is a bit surprised uh, what, uh, with what we have heard uh, from the young people actually from Kosovo and from Serbia as well. Uh, sadly, I have to say that uh, we run in the circle as a society, of course, for more than two decades, basically, that nobody knows actually where the right exit is. And this is one of the issues, you know, hypothetically speaking, that unfortunately are witness we are all witnessing actually, as I said, in the past two decades. Uh, at this point of time, it, it is not really only a uh, sole question speaking on the integration issues, of course, uh, of the part of the Kosovo Serb community or the Serbian population in general, of course, but it's, uh, it's uh, more of that actually in the, is on the state. So, first of all, my major impression over what we have heard uh, and what we saw today in the short video basically is that just a common denominator for Serbs and Albanians, as you can see, that the people are not really a problem, but the political leaders they are. And this is exactly what I'm taking from here, actually. So, uh, we, are, I think, pretty much vocal enough, of course, not only in Kosovo, but in Serbia as well, pointing out that the political leaders, especially the key policy makers on both sides, are really causing more problems rather than to be a solution these days. And this is something that nobody, I think, uh, cannot really get away just like that, of course, and say like, okay, but they're trying to resolve the problems. Of course they try, but they, there is a certainly an individual interest, not only the, per, the party interest, but the individual interest, how to approach the things, whether they would be able actually to, to move the things forward or not. So basically, well, what happens in the ground, uh, which means among the people and the citizens, of course, in Kosovo, especially when it comes to non-majority communities, sadly, I have to say, it doesn't really look promising. 
Otherwise, we wouldn't be really even sitting here over, over here, of course, discussing about the position, about the mutual relations, about the huge ethnic distance, and about, above all, of course, the treatments of the central level institutions, of course, when it comes to the non-majority communities in Kosovo. So I'm sorry to, uh, to sound pessimistic, of course, but I would say a little bit of the brighter side of the story of the picture. So um, Brussels agreement, no matter what, you know, and no matter how uh, widely have been actually criticized, it brought, it was a real game changer and it brought the new momentum within the political dynamics and including the social dynamic of Kosovo and especially between Serbs and Albanians. Because if you clearly remember, I'm not going to really go deeply down in the, you know, far away actually into the past, but if we clearly remember 2011, 10, 11 and 12, to what degree we had a conflict, especially in the northern part of Kosovo, to what degree the institutions were really dysfunctional, then we have to say really that the Brussels Agreement widened the opportunity for at least, you know, mutual acceptance of the fact that the Serbs and Albanians are living there and that we have to find the, you know, the way forward and the abilities, of course, of both political elites to move the things forward uh, for the sake, of course, and for the benefit of the citizens. Now we come to a problem. Dominica mentioned rightly, uh, of course, what went wrong. Everyone knows, you know, that uh, different things actually are on the plate, but the major issue and the major point of this agreement is not a secret. Everyone knows that. Of course, there's a status question, the, the issue of the final status of Kosovo. What for Kosovo is resolved already, for Serbia it is not. We speak about the two different issues which are the main point of conflict which cannot be really resolved, at least not really in due course. So are we going to wait another five to ten years actually until both parties agree what the final status of Kosovo is going to be? Or are we going to really try to push the both parties and both elites, political elites, to recognize the community interest which is su supposed to be strongly embedded into their policy in order really to unblock the things and to move things forward? This is not happening. And this is the problem why the things are not really, the dialogue process is not really moving the right direction. We heard, the one, one of them was saying actually, we heard that the political elites are not really, you know, meeting the community demands, the community expectations and so on. But they're still both, Pristina and Belgrade, they're still in a sense ignorant towards the community demands, towards the community interest, you know, towards the interest of the prosperity of communities in general, and this is one of the issues, you know, which, which requires a really a significant and tremendous efforts, and especially the commitment of both elites actually to move the things forward. How they are going to do it? Very simple. At least from my point of view, of course, very simple. They need to abandon, of course, a very stubborn <laughs> policy, which in a sense, you know, is blocking the current agreement, actually the current dialogue process. Um, I risked in Pristina by saying that the status question actually should be really uh, a little bit set aside in order to widen the opportunity for both parties actually to, be, to deal with the substantial issues because of the insistence, of course, to reach out to um, a compromise through recognition, mutual recognition. They should really try to get focus onto the practical elements actually that tackle and that affects the day-to-day -day life for citizens. The status question, of course, will come to probably to an end, as it was pointed out so many times. I'm not the one actually to decide upon when uh, the status question will actually be, will, will be discussed, but at least we can just fairly offer a way forward how the things actually will be unblocked. The status question, no matter what, sooner or later will be again back on the table, that's for sure. But if we're really going, as I said, I need to repeat that once again, if we really need to wait another five to 10 years, until both parties actually reach out a sort of compromise in that direction, the life will pass by basically, and we're gonna risk, honestly, uh, a huge brain drain and um, economy, stalled economy, and many other negative effects, of course, that will affect, of course, the society in general. Of course, the international community has the primary role in that, um, and we, we saw by witnessing basically what have happened lately with the security incidents in northern part of Kosovo that Engagement of the international community is definitely a must. It is a something which honestly cannot be really avoided in any sense. We can really just recommend, of course, to the EU and other stakeholders that are very much interested, of course, 
uh, to conclude actually as soon as possible the dialogue process, at least you know, to, to result in a positive manner. But again, when we saw what is happening on the ground, the engagement of the international community is really still on the highest priority of both parties. Because uh, obviously we failed, as I said, at least the political elites failed basically to commit to the full trust building uh, agenda and the full peaceful, of course, and stability resolution of the long lasting conflict between Belgrade and Pristina. And of course, the final point of that, you know, what needs to be done and what is ahead of us, of course, in the next five years. I hope actually, I want, to, I want to really to recommend that this is what I said already publicly somewhere. They need really. I speak, this is just, just totally actually a message to uh, Mr. Lychak and his team. The agenda, the current framework, negotiation framework, actually need to be a little bit reshuffled, of course, in order to be shaped better and in order to uh, set up the ground rules that needs to be set up, uh, that needs to be already, of course, in place, in order, as I said, of course, for the things and for the dialogue process to move forward. Both parties, I've just mentioned three of them, the key principles, both parties, needs, absolutely, this is a must, of course, refrain from many inflammatory, insulting public narrative, of course, against one another. This is a must, and this is really not happening. What is happening, actually, at the moment in the public spectrum, it's shameful. Honestly, it's shameful for both societies, and it doesn't really contribute to the peaceful uh, peace, actually, and the stability that's supposed to be there. The second thing, very much important, is basically a joint conferences, press conferences. What we saw basically and what we are witnessing, what is going on and what is happening in Brussels, after each round of uh, the dialogue process, basically we have both delegations issuing a public statements or press statements basically separately with a lot of ambiguities. So we continue with the same framework, with the same agenda, with the same approach, of course, being constructive, you know, presenting actually a model of constructive ambiguity. That must be awarded. And with that, of course, with the joint press conferences, this is one of the things that needs to set actually well in advance in order really to issue a one joint statement. Both parties upon their return from Brussels, of course, they're going to have a fantastic opportunity, of course, to approach the media and convey the messages, whatever, you know, they wish. However, and I'll finish with this, um, uh, whatever, you know, uh, if they avoid, uh, I'm sorry, the EU, as a large portion, actually, in large degree of responsibility in that particular regard. And the final point on this is basically uh, there must be a, a sort of um, a different approach, at least a game changer that should be really introduced uh, within the dialogue process. And this is about thinking uh, on the solution or on the possibilities for the dialogue to be relocated from Brussels to Belgrade and Pristina. Uh, I know that it's a bit tricky. I know it's not really popular whatsoever it may actually even damage part of the political support when it comes, especially when it comes to Serbia, but of course it is not going to be also a sort of sided in that story. But for the sake of normality, for the sake of uh, introducing uh, really a new approach, this is one of the things that needs to be really back on the, Thanks. not back, but really strongly Thank recommended. You. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot, Miodrag. Um, uh, Maya, you presented the survey, but I would be very curious to, to hear your, uh, your thoughts on... Uh, Miodrag mentioned that politics are seen as a detriment. We, I think we picked this up from the videos as well. Uh, there is also no commitment from the political elites to move the process forward. Tonika uh, suggested that there has to be an intensified cooperation between US and EU, and uh, Miodrag suggests that there has to be a different framework. What is your take? What would it need to, to change uh, for the process to, to take a different turning, for, for a better turning in general? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I agree with, with uh, my previous colleagues and uh, we all know that uh, politicians can change their minds or do something when they're exposed to a greater pressure, both bottom up from coming from the public, uh, but also from the international pressure. So I understand this uh, call that uh, US and uh, EU can uh, work better together uh, in future um, when working also with political leaders to uh, pressure them more uh, to deliver something. Uh, when it comes to uh, Serbia, uh, what we actually see that uh, Vucic has strong control over, over the politics and public opinion poll. 
and then he can, um, uh, in this situation with concentration of power, he can really de deliver something. But um, the dominant feeling here in Serbia is that not much will change in, in the next uh, in the next five uh, years, which is. Uh, a little bit depressing for us who is trying to push for uh, uh, push leaders to work more and to deliver and to implement uh, remaining the agreements. Um, there are many things to be done uh, and like thank you up from uh, the video. Um, if uh, leaders con continue to maintain or deepen this ethnic uh, business and uh, divisions, then uh, I believe in this kind of atmosphere and context we cannot expect uh, implementation of agreements. So the other thing that should be done is to work to actually close the, uh, this gap and to work on uh, trust building between uh, Serbs and Albanians even more in future. Uh, what could be uh, also done, um, unfortunately in Serbia it wasn't done properly, uh, that is uh, conducting uh, inclusive uh, domestic dialogue uh, on what really uh, needs to be done in future. And I believe that uh, on Kosovo side, the politicians actually announced it, but uh, it didn't uh, conduct it in practice. And maybe for Albania uh, politician, it would be also good to conduct an inclusive uh, domestic dialogue and engage in uh, dialogue with Serbs in Kosovo in order then to counterbalance uh, actually the, the leverage that Serbia has over Kosovo Serbs and to uh, convey a message. I believe that politicians should convey a message um, both, uh, on both sides uh, when it comes to Albanian politicians that they should convey the message that uh, ethnic Serbs uh, in Kosovo are valued and treated equally within, uh, uh, within the country and that the government in Pristina should actually improve their, uh, their lives and include them more uh, in, uh, in decision making and uh, provide uh, them access to ins uh, institution. This also should be done in Serbia as well because what we are noticing is weak social cohesion in, civil so uh, in society and this kind of message should be also sent to Albanians living in Serbia uh, coming from the Serbian politicians that they should be also uh, valued uh, here in society and they should have more access uh, in decision making and um, uh, into the institutions and that's uh, what I'm seeing that uh, this, this is also uh, missing. Uh, and uh, what I also believe when it comes uh, when it comes to this dialogue uh, and um, and the whole process of implementation of agreement, I really stand and believe that functional democracy and democratic uh, institutions could do more to implement agreements. And I I would like to see in our societies, uh, especially in Serbia stronger parliamentary oversight because I believe that effective parliament is at the core of democracy and should hold government accountable or, and politicians accountable for what they're uh, doing. And I believe that uh, that thing is missing and that could increase even transparency uh, and give more transparency uh, to the process. Uh, but also like public scrutiny is quite important to, to move things forward. However, we, we, we seen from this data and from the video that people uh, miss basic information, what, what's going on from the process, from the agreement and how this will affect uh, the life. In order to increase also public scrutiny of the process, uh, people need to have uh, more objective and uh, reliable um, implementation and uh, uh, I, I will go back again that uh, I believe that uh, nobody worked previously on building national consensus on working with different groups prior to reaching, reaching the, the agreement. Um, one of my personal objections is a leadership style uh, uh, in this dialogue and uh, there is constant message that if uh, if 
anything is uh, agreed behind the closed doors between uh, elites, some things could be reached. I uh, advocate for more openness, and I think that uh, we, we are witnessing like a leadership crisis uh, in this room, that uh, it's all a secret, it's all behind the closed door, and uh, just we are all sh shut out from this process. We, as we consider ourselves as uh, someone who is more informative public, and then uh, people are ex excluded. So we don't own this process, and there is lack of uh, local ownership of, of the process. So we feel that uh, agreements and the dialogue is imposed mm -hmm. to us. I believe that some, somebody also said it. So in order to have uh, uh, people on board and uh, something that people can uphold, uh, I believe that uh, leadership also style and more openness is needed and building that consensus around uh, this agenda, around the content of the dialogue is needed uh, in, in future to support this process and not to block um, everything on the ground. Thanks, Maya. Donika, you want to come in very briefly? Before I give yeah. you the floor, I just want to say that there is already one question from the online audience. Mm -hmm. um, after Donika's brief uh, uh, intervention, I want to also pick up a question or two from the audience, if there is any, before I pass it on to my colleague, Vesela. I'm here for an unpopular opinion. Uh, <laughs> we should address the elephant in the room. I mean, I do support the step-by-step -step approach, which would lead to recognition, but did it lead us to or recognition or uh, improvement of relations between Kosovo and Serbia after 11 years? Or it didn't. I mean, it didn't work. So if we try something and it didn't work, should we just, you know, go more with a different approach? Meaning that we should address the elephant in the room, which is recognition, because we have two leaders which can deliver. We have Vucic in Serbia because, I mean, I'm assuming he's going nowhere, even after the next elections, which will be held in April. And uh, Kurti has a very strong legitimacy in Kosovo by winning more than 50%, first time in history, having in the entire parliament and the government, and actually having the support of the community. I'm sure that any agreement which would have been pushed by Kurti would have been supported by, by the society in Kosovo because of the trust towards him as a leader. So I think this is a, I mean, let's think differently. Let, let's not try something that it didn't work. I mean, it did work partially because we, of course, have the benefits of both technical and political dialogue. The situation is not as bad as in 2011. Uh, but the level of democracy is definitely worse. So if we engage in another let's wait and see approach, let's try to talk about less sensitive topics, we just prolong this stabilitocracy uh, uh, cycle which has started since 2011 when the dialogue between <coughs> Kosovo and Serbia has been launched. And it was further emphasized in 2013 when the Brussels Agreement has been um, uh, uh, signed. Now, we don't know uh, where is the, is there a fine line between the reforms and, and stability? Because it's not, because the EU constantly sells uh, reforms for stability. Uh, so if we continue with this, I don't think it's going to be a good approach. That's why I mentioned the EU and the US, because we have light check, we have a renewed EU uh, interest in, in the region. And these windows, of, uh, windows of, of, of opportunity do not create quite often and let's face it, we are a very, very small region. There are lots of ongoing conflicts around the world. So we are having EU, and then we are having US, and then we are having two leaders which can actually deliver and sell it to the citizens. And, and we are doing nothing. We are just uh, going to, again, start with you know, minor issues and hoping that this will bring us somewhere. So I'm just, you know, being thinking outside of the box because now it's like kind of the end of the world to think about potential recognition. I mean, this is also coming from the EU, like no recognition can be acceptance, whatever. You call it whatever you want, but not recognition. But the point is not to have a Cyprus in the EU, not to have more bilateral issues which the EU cannot solve at a later stage. So let's do it now. Let's think about you know, a potential deal that might lead to recognition or build upon that 
and then think about solving open issues because there are many between Kosovo and Serbia. With Dragisha, we're talking about energy and it's, it's enormous. It's so huge that it will take years and years to be solved. And uh, let's do the solving of other issues after we have this dialogue finished with a recognition. Thanks, Danika. Um, if there is a question that, if there is a burning question, there is one. Sonia. Uh, there should be a microphone. and I also want to congratulate all the panelists for their passion to discuss these things uh, for a number of years <laughs> after uh, being faced with a number of uh, local and less local uh, pressures and challenges. Um, in a mode that Donika just said to be the elephant in the room, uh, I wanted to ask uh, what could break the impasse because what we are dis discussing is just why that we are stuck and what should be done but not what politicians want to do or it seems that actually from uh, this perspective it seems that the West doesn't want to engage really in a novel way at least until they finish all the elections that Dominika mentioned uh, next year. So one of the arguments I heard in a similar discussion with colleagues from civil society from uh, Kosovo and Serbia was that the next thing that could break the impasse would be violence. That that's the only thing that could actually wake up both the local and international audience. And I'm just curious of what your prognosis, is it imaginable now, again, and what kind of violence or, you know, um, elephant in a room would actually change the dynamics and got to the attention of both international and the local. Uh, constituency. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Sonia. I will add to that a question from Pierre Mirel. Mm. To my recollection, the most hopeful period was 2011-2013 under the so-called technical dialogue, which I was part of with Robert Cooper. Don't you think that the focus should now be on ensuring full implementation of, of what was then agreed to the benefits of citizens? I like to ask uh, We'll start with you, Mio Drag, then Donika and Maya, very, very briefly, because we then want to also move on to other panelists. One minute each to answer the question? Mio Drag. Wow. Really, like, really, one minute. Well, you can do it. Well, <laughs> well, well thank you very much. Of course, I'll try to be fast, actually. <laughs> um, honestly, uh, Mr. Mirel is very much right, of course. I mean, what happened, actually, we had a number of agreements, and many of them were really partially implemented. Some of them, they are not, of course, and many of them, they are implemented, but they require a further revision. Nobody is dealing with that any longer, of course. I mean, not any longer, but not in a way that's supposed to be done, you know, because apparently the agreements that were already agreed, achieved, and so on, uh, they are lacking the monitoring, uh, a substantial and sufficient monitoring mechanism that will evaluate its implementation, of course. And that mechanism needs to be established by the EU. Once it is being established by the EU, the progress report, in a sense, a progress report on the dialogue process, or specifically on the implementation, has to be really issued with the concrete recommendations, setting up the timeline of its implementation so and many other of course, things when it comes to that. Sonia did mention, I would like really to reflect shortly on this. Sonia did mention a violence. This is a, one of the greatest threats actually for our society. Because apparently everyone within this protest forgot about the community interest, about the people's interest, about the people itself. Because apparently everyone is seeking for the great political deal. Nobody knows what's going on with the community besides the civil society organization and some other minor actors, actually. Thank we you. wanted really to, with the final, final point, we want really to bring the people's interest onto the surface to complement and to enrich the current discussion in order to recognize the shape, recognize community interest, and to shape uh, the future agreements in a sense they are really implementable and, of course, they can serve its purpose. Thanks. 
Donika, you can be more disciplined then. Oh, violent. <laughs> I agree with Sonia. I mean, uh, just I, I, I remember 2018 when uh, Tashi and Vucic, you know, and the Alba Forum launched the idea of potential territorial exchange. It was all, you know, EU and, you know, potential member states were like alarmed and they were sleeping from 2013 to 2018. So it was the threat of potential conflict and instability that kind of woke them up. And uh, unfortunately, this is what our leaders know already, and that's why they constantly cause crisis in order to solve the crisis and then to sell it to the EU. So this is a very simple transaction, which is, has been there and it's continuing to be there. The EU keeps, you know, sort of engaging in this, uh, in this uh, transaction. Uh, so not just the North, but it's going to be a lot more. Uh, I mean, we, we saw the train and then the uh, arrest of uh, Marco Juric and then all the cases, all these, you know, have been in a way staged in cooperation or individually between the leaders. The sole purpose of it is, you know, to create a feeling of instability in order to, to freak out the EU Thanks. and they are very good at it. Uh, as for, you know, what we can do is like really sound positive, genuine approach of the EU, of course. Uh, a EU enlargement perspective should be there. If, I mean, if we have North Macedonia as an example that no one is going to sign any agreement because they are getting nothing in the EU integration. Uh, process, and Perfect this is something point. that the EU should be clear about. Maya, very briefly. Well, yeah, when Sonia mentioned violence, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's tough, but uh, uh, what we are witnessing that like, uh, relations between Kosovo and Serbia are fragile, and uh, uh, any kind of mentioning of non-paper, land swap, etc., could actually disturb this relation. So, but uh, it's not violence, it's not in the best interest of the citizens and that's something what political leaders, they know. Um, if we want to uh, trace the pattern on the metrics before the dialogue on, uh, uh, on the license plate, we had the crisis. In also 2011, before uh, that uh, dialogue, like also we had the Arinia and the barricades. So I don't want to actually think, uh, think in that way that uh, before we have any, th any kind of bigger agreement, we'll have crisis first or regime change on anything else. Uh, but what I'm noticing that Vucic is maybe, uh, Vucic's willingness to deliver uh, on some kind of Kosovo deal will uh, the maybe will be conditioned on uh, some sweeteners for Serbia, mm -hmm. what kind of sweetener Serbia is offered. And maybe uh, that sweetener is that economic mir miracle uh, that the US uh, Special Envoy was uh, mentioning, oh. uh, talking about uh, two days ago. So maybe that's a yeah. what big sweetener like uh, coming from the economy that could uh, make some breakthrough uh, in, in this uh, process. More investment. Thank you. Vesela, I pass the baton on to you. Thank you very much. I think this is the right moment uh, to include the EU voice in this. Um, and I was wondering, <coughs> listening especially to the last intervention, after the huge amount of money that the EU is pouring in this region, people here still are still waiting for the US to give them the financial sweetener. Um, <laughs> after your many years in this region, Ambassador Pandor, what do you think is the reason that people do not trust the EU as a mediator? Um, how can we, uh, I don't know, ter ter transfer what we have invested in this region as a leverage and to re-dynamize uh, uh, the dialogue in this particular case. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation uh, to this discussion. Uh, and uh, to answer briefly, we definitely have to improve our communication. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, um, These type of events uh, clearly have an important role play, uh, to play in the dialogue process, particularly bringing, uh, in bringing normalization closer to the citizens. Uh, and um, uh, this is essential, essential for uh, building trust or for breaking, as the name of the panel states, a circle of distrust. Um, in the last 10 years, the dialogue has brought uh, so many 
real and tangible results, which made the uh, lives for the people in Kosovo and Serbia better. Uh, it was mentioned during, uh, from uh, the panelists, uh, but, uh, well, let's uh, just um, say a couple of them. Uh, from uh, people and uh, goods moving freely between Kosovo and Serbia to agreeing on a system to collect custom revenues at the crossing points and feeding them into the Kosovo budget, to the integration of the police and judiciary in the north in the Kosovo system to holding local elections. And in the dialogue, the parties also agreed on symbolic issues like the International Dialogue Code for Kosovo. So in my opinion, the positive sides of the process were simply not stressed enough uh, over the years. But of course, uh, we are all aware that uh, there is more to be done, and I think nobody in this round uh, or the audience ever thought this would be an easy process, uh, because change rarely happens overnight. So it takes time. We saw that just recently with the escalation of the tensions in the north of Kosovo over the uh, issue of the license plates, uh, as well as the uh, police operations. Uh, such issues make uh, the dialogue even more important, as witnessed uh, that under the auspices of the EU facilitated dialogue on 30 September, two sides brokered arrangements to resolve the tensions and de-escalate the situation. So this framework allowed for quick coordination and intervention of all international actors to defuse the crisis. Such coordinations need to continue. And it was mentioned, of course, the uh, cooperation between the European Union and the US. Uh, I think uh, we are doing well uh, in this cooperation. Uh, we are, uh, I, I'm talking about now the uh, US Arlajak's team uh, and about himself. Uh, we are in regular contact uh, with our US counterparts. Uh, we had uh, uh, visits uh, together when the ESR Lajcak and uh, Mr. Palmer uh, visited uh, the region together. Uh, Mr. Escobar was present in Brussels uh, when the already mentioned uh, agreement on the place was brokered. So uh, I think, yes, uh, the, the, uh, the cooperation is uh, essential. Uh, but uh, I also have to state that it's uh, going on. We are going in the, it's, it's, uh, it's better than it was and uh, we uh, have to continue uh, this uh, really strong uh, cooperation between the European Union and the US. Thank you very much. I'm sure there will be also questions uh, to you. We can uh, pick a couple from the panel, but before that, uh, I'll turn to Sylvie Kaufmann, um, with whom we traveled uh, throughout the region for the past four days. Um, we were also in uh, northern Mitrovica and in Pristina, and uh, uh, now we're in Belgrade. And what we're hearing, uh, Sylvie, uh, has been that um, there is some sense of stagnation. Um, but obviously all of this is happening not, not in a vacuum. It's happening against the background of a difficult debate in, in Europe, not only on enlargement, but in general on rule of law, what are the red lines for the EU, which way the EU should be going. So how do you see this very important process for the Balkans, the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue, against this larger uh, picture? Yeah, thank you very much and, and thank you for having me here. It's, a, it's really a great pleasure to be in, in Belgrade uh, and in this region. Um, well, they have there has been talk about elephants in the room, and I think there are quite a lot. <laughs> it's a bit crowded, uh, but one, I think the m biggest elephant in the room is this wave of autocracy and, and this fight that we have to uh, lead uh, against autocracy and for democracy. And, and this is all over, uh, not only the region, but the West. I mean, we saw what happened in the United States for four years. So, um, uh, you know, you cannot, I don't think you can dissociate uh, all this process. Um, if you, I, I keep thinking of the difference of the timeline between the first wave of enlargement, you know, 1989, 2004, it's 15 years, 10 countries, uh, for, for the first 10 countries, 
uh, which joined uh, the EU after the, the collapse of communism. And, and here we are talking about 18 years for since uh, Thessaloniki, uh, and, and we're not, we haven't even really started. I mean, we have started formally, but we are really very, very far away from the goal. So uh, what happened, of course, both situations are different. Central Europe and the Balkans are different situations, but um, and with the complication of the war and, and, and its consequences, but also Europe has changed. The world has changed. The, the direction is not so clear anymore. And, and we all have to uh, take this into account. And, and uh, you know, it's a common battle. So. Um, Europe was about values, and is still about values, I think. How can the EU be enlarged to other countries if we don't agree on those values inside and outside? So, um, you know, of course it takes leadership, but it also takes a lot of citizen participation. Um, yes, it takes external pressure, certainly, uh, and intervention, and the EU does have a role and it hasn't stayed idle for all those years, but uh, you know, I, I think all these elements have to be taken together. And, and um, if, we, if we want to give a new impulse to this uh, uh, dynamic and to integration and to solving the, the, the problems between Serbs and, uh, and Serbia and Kosovo, and, uh, I don't think any of those can be really taken separately. I think we all have to work together by keeping very clear the goal that we had at the beginning and that we have to, um, to, 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 to stay uh, very, uh, to stick to. Uh, I really think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very important. And um, there were a couple of comments which were made which I think uh, by the previous, previous speakers which I think are very uh, significant. You know, Miodorek said we've been running into circles for two decades without seeing the exit. <laughs> uh, uh, Maya said we don't own this process. Uh, so these are really things which are basic and uh, uh, maybe we should go back to basic and focus on what we want, um, what is the direction and, and um, and you know, and 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 work on this. Um, one last thing about the U.S. involvement. Yes, it is important, but this is a European affair. Mm. This is, you know, of course, it's great if the, if our American friends can help. Uh, I think the fact that China is so active is not, uh, um, for, uh, you know, is also a factor that 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 the U.S. is coming back to this region, and it's it's good. Uh, but basically, first of all, this is a European problem that we have to uh, solve. Be, you know, f we have to be, in the, to be the first actors on this, definitely, and to put the biggest energy. Thank you very much. Now is the moment for you in the audience uh, again to jump in if uh, you have comments uh, or questions to to our panelists. In the meantime, I'm going to ask uh, our friends from Kosovo and Serbia, do you think it's important that both sides are democratic, starting from what uh, Sylvie just said, in order to have a successful negotiation? Of course, I mean, who would say no? Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the basics. I mean, before that, I mean, before answering your question, I think one of the biggest problem in the EU facilitated dialogue was the ownership. And now we have like, you know, like, not a, a new which is not ready to take ownership in a process which is facilitated by them. And this is constantly being said to the party, this is your process, yes, but it's EU facilitated dialogue. The mandate has been given in 2011 to the EU to solve it, combining it with the EU membership card. So it is an owner, and the EU should act like an owner. Uh, and not 
finding the agreements in the external action service website is one of the key, one of the first steps showing that they don't want to do anything with it. It's facilitated by them. Would the EU take ownership if the process was successful? Would probably do. So why not take ownership if the process goes wrong? So this is something, we need more strong ownership to push the parties towards uh, towards a better implementation of the, of the agreement because this is what the EU actually was mandated for. And the second one, yes, I mean, sure, we want, you know, it is imperative for the countries to be democracies in order to deliver. But from what we have seen from 2011, it's the con completely different uh, uh, trajectory. It is actually democratic backsliding in the name of stability, which was given through the EU uh, facilitated dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia. So uh, rule of law first, and this is something that we as civil society have pushed for so long, and then transparency, and then genuine approach. It doesn't have to be 100% transparency, like in the case of North Macedonia and Greece, but it has to be positive messages sent by the leaders, as Miodrag said, in joint conferences, in order to create conducive environment for the agreements to be acceptable and implementable. Thank you. Just one technical question. There is a countdown here that shows me that we have still nine minutes, because we started late. No, we don't. Sonia is telling me we should finish. Unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, this was planned as a, as a short panel. We, will, we can shorten it even a little bit more, but I will still want to give the floor once more to Maya and to New Drag for... And if, Ambassador, you want to say something, maybe we go first to you then. Thank you very much, if I may. Uh, it was said several times uh, by U.S. Lychak and uh, other uh, EU uh, representatives that uh, this process is not owned by the EU. It's owned by Belgrade and Pristina. We are facilitator in this process, as we were always facilitator. So uh, I can understand that uh, somebody must be blamed that it's going slow. Uh, but as I said, this is the process of Baghdad and Pristina. So uh, I uh, agree uh, with the representatives of the civil society uh, that uh, uh, NGOs uh, should and have to do more. They have to deal with, with the people. Uh, they have to bring uh, closer the process to the people. Uh, and uh, actually, it's you who can, who can press the politicians to do something. Uh, it's uh, when we are uh, organizing a meeting between Belgrade and Pristina and the politicians, uh, whether, it be, whether it would be on the chief negotiator or the highest level, uh, we are setting some agenda, of course but it's up to them, up to the two sides, what we are talking about. Thank you. Thank you. I also believe, by the way, that nothing can be genuine in international relations if the sides do not really buy into yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Maya, you talked about ownership as well. Is that what Ambassador Kandor, uh, the, the, what you meant? Uh, yes, par partly, but also like the ownership uh, of the process that also citizens have. And uh, on that note, uh, and uh, I emphasized during my presentation how uh, important I feel that democracy is important for this process as well, because um, my impression that this process is captured uh, by one single person from the perspective of Serbia or hijacked. And that power is extracted from the institutions. And I believe that it has to be uh, brought back to the institutions that, uh, unfortunately, we're not seeing this, but something I would like to see, and I truly believe that through the institutions we like democratic institution, we can uh, hold our, our government uh, accountable, and I believe that that's one of the solutions. Thanks a lot. What are the institutions, Miodrag, that you think uh, could help you uh, as the Serb community in Kosovo? Right, I would say really in short that our accountability and commitment uh, are just the common denominator actually for both sides, for Kosovo and for Serbia or Pristina and Belgrade to be absolutely politically correct. Once we ensured, you know, that both sides are very much accountable to their constituencies, committed to the process, we may expect actually for them to do more. 
uh, fortunately we're gonna end and I didn't really plan to to say like to finish on the pessimistic note but I'm, I'm seriously I honestly fear that we're gonna end actually with uh, yet another really minimal progress in missed opportunities you know uh, for years to come Maybe the institution's question is really a key one, also it is. for you, although you're not answering that No, one. I'll answer to you actually what was expected, but we, we are short in time. What is being expected from the institutions actually to recognize once again the community interest, the people's interest, which is not really at present, of course, very much present and embedded into their policies. They claim to be actually a community voice, which in fact they are not. And this is the circle actually of the accountability and commitment to the process itself. We did try to give you the viewpoints, not only of the politicians, which is the usual thing that we do, <laughs> but to give you um, more voices from the ground. And I'm very grateful to those colleagues who helped us put, the, put that together. Uh, and I believe that uh, really getting public buy-in, I think we all agree uh, on that, is the key to uh, to having a success uh, in this process. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it at least as much as we did and enjoyed the rest of the, uh, of the afternoon.